Ladies and thank you very much for coming to the show tonight. I know um, it's one of the hottest days of the year here in Edinburgh, and it is it is very difficult. A lot of people have pulled themselves away from a barbecue to be indoors here. Now, let me tell you this. It is the 80s show here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that you've come to see. It's a brand new show here, all about growing up during the 80s. Before I start, can I just check to see how many people like me can remember sweatbands? Who can remember wearing sweatbands? Yes. Yes, yes. Who, who can remember when phone boxes were used for making phone calls and not having a ring? Who remembers that? Do you think one? Good, good. Who remembers when Back to the Future was a film and not a drugs reference? Who can remember that? You know that? Only a few people. Okay, make some noise if you can remember when we were in the EU. Can anyone remember that? You know that? Ladies and gentlemen, it's always nice doing a show in Edinburgh where one bloke brings seven women like a hurry. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, it's always nice here. Listen, let me tell you this. Uh, I did run around the room and it was nice to see people of different ages. We've got some young people. Where are the young people? The people who weren't even born in the 80s. Make some noise of your 90s. I love it. Look at the girls nudging each other on Facebook. We're only 22, Sandra. <laughs> Make some noise if you were born in the 90s. There you go, the children. Oh, and can you hear that? Did you hear? Did you hear the jealousy that followed? <laughs> What year in the 90s? Shout out the year. Four. What? Four? You were born in four, the year four. So you're over a couple of thousand years old. So 94, let's have a look. Stand up, let's have a look at you. Ladies and gentlemen, will you give the youth of today? Where are you? Stand up, 94. You what? The back row. Oh, the back row. Sorry, the back row. 94, right at the back. Listen, let me tell you this. You're only a baby, so you'll be like 22 years old. Now, see this, right? Look at this room here. There's people here who live through the 80s. My guys here, some of, the, some of the guys, the guy you saw up here dancing, oh my God, he was, he was in Vietnam, 81, 82, 83, 85, he was in Little, 86, Neto. Uh, oh, I actually just realized there's a child in. Come in, love. Social worker's here, she's at the back. Can't miss her, she's shouting, four, four. And, uh, and this is what happens. It was an amazing year during the 80s. It was a decade, an amazing decade. Loads of things happened. Now, for the kids, um, you'll learn a lot. Let me tell you this, right? Look, um, you're still growing up. You're going to have amazing years. They're life changing. Look at this, right? Uh, look at 2016. Children growing up now. This year has been amazing. We haven't even finished the year. Look what's been going on. Look at it. Boris Johnson, Foreign Secretary, right? Now, that is unheard of. For the young kids, this means nothing. For the older people, you wouldn't even let them out the house. They might not the country, right? <laughs> And then you've got Donald Trump could be the leader of America by the end of this year. Unbelievable, isn't it? Obviously, if he does get in, people will just build walls around him so he can't get out. Just loads of walls. 2016, more people have died this year from playing Pokemon Go, right, than syphilis. Now, to the kids, it, that won't mean anything to you, syphilis. It was something that was, it was, it was a big killer for us when we were in the 80s. Pokemon Go is unbelievable. Where, have we got kids at the front? Oh, you're young. How old are you then? 15. Oh my goodness. Jesus. So you were born this century. That is unbelievable. That's 2001, 2001, 2002. My guy here, look at it. He, he's got patio down that's older than you. <laughs> he's put a patio, 1998, in his house. Oh, that's all that. Nothing will outlive this patio. Look at that. 15 years old, 2001. So, you, this is your generation, look at this. Pokemon Go. Point at someone in the room that you think plays Pokemon Go. Right, look at the front row, look at the front row. Point it's normally a 50-50% chance you're out there. It's huge, 50% of the people in Britain are playing it. But look, try and point to someone in the front row you think has got nothing that isn't a landline. That's got like a proper mobile. <laughs> They want to play Pokemon Go. Come on, we're going out the house. Bring the phone. <laughs> Hello, I'm looking for you. <laughs> I'm joking, you're only babies. Go on, go on, have a, have a guess. Who do you think he is? Got Pokemon? He's, he's young. The lad there behind you. He plays Pokemon Go. You don't know? Wait, uh, uh, so that when I say guess, it means you're not going to know the answer. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I didn't really think that you're Gandalf, and then you, you could just go, oh, I know everything. 
I was born in this century, I've got it all covered. <laughs> but roughly, it possibly looks like him, he's young, isn't he? Probably, yeah, 50 50 chance, he probably does, yeah, I don't know. How old are you? Yeah, the guy that's looking round for other people. <laughs> The guy that's looking around, I don't know who's... 49. 49. Jesus, that is amazing. Well done. <laughs> and you've taken the face of a 27-year-old. That is... That is the fountain of youth there, wherever this guy... Just every day, he's just killing lambs and putting blood on his face. <laughs> wow, well done. Well done. So, uh, so possibly not. Maybe he does. I don't know. Okay, Pokemon. Okay, this is a little bit tougher then. This will be hard for you. Uh, I want you to point to someone in the room who you think has got syphilis. <laughs> so, <laughs> stop. Don't put your hand up. Okay, just don't. Let's guess. Look at the glass up there. They're going, I think we can see him. Okay, I'm joking. Uh, 15 year old, you won't know what syphilis Syphilis was a style of dance in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's back again, Jackie. <laughs> so the, uh, it is amazing, isn't it? 2016, you look at that. There will be, there will be children in the future talking about 2016. Oh, what an amazing year. There is children in Leicester, growing up in Leicester, a lot younger than you, little kids growing up in Leicester who were thinking, oh my God, 2016, what an amazing year for Leicester. They won the English League, right? And they were the English Premier League. There's children growing up there going, oh my God, it's unbelievable, Leicester is the best city in the world. The whole media attention is here at Leicester. They're watching these kids going, oh my God, they're coming to celebrate. Not realizing that is a one-off. It was a one-off event, wasn't it? It's never happened in the history of Leicester. It probably never happened again. These poor kids will live in social deprivation. But it was an event that happened for them, right? <laughs> And it shows how amazing things are like that. Like, Leicester City were given odds of 5,000 to one on to win the premiership, right? The start of the season. The bookies didn't want to give them odds. They were like, going, oh my God. He'll get relegated, the one and three. And they went, no, by law, you've got to give every team odds. So they said, look, 5,000 to one, I'll have that. Show you how bad it was. Barcelona were given odds of 400 to one to win the English Premier League. They had better odds than Leicester City. People going in, what, 5,000 to one Leicester? Now, what have you got for Barcelona? I've got to tell you on that. Now. And, and it is unbelievable. Football is crazy. It's, it's one of them, it's unbelievable. You look at it, everyone else, women, you've seen it, you? You've seen when people fight, they fight forwards like that. Football fans are the only people who fight backwards. The crazy, they're always like, come on then, come on then, come on then, come on then. Because uh, they're always worried about being offside. Watch out, lines means there, everyone back, back like this. Snooker fans are the worst. Have you ever seen snooker fans fight? It is ridiculous. It takes ages for them to hit you. They just walk around looking for the best shot. Oh, I can't reach, pass me a stick. <laughs> In, uh, in May, I came up here to Edinburgh to do a show, and on the train, it was packed, and people from all over the world were coming up here, and there was a guy in there, and he was a Hibs fan, and Hibs had a massive landmark year. It's the first time in 113 years they'd won the Scottish Cup, right? On the train, this guy's telling everyone, he said, happy about it, fair enough, it's exciting. Another bloke gets up in the middle of the train like this, and just goes, all right, pal, ye. Sick of this, choose a windy, because you're leaving, right? <laughs> Now, for the English people, let me tell you what he just said. He said, right, choose a window because you're leaving. Now, that is a threat. That is a threat, but it's also a very polite threat because you're giving options of where you want to be thrown out of. <laughs> There's me, I'm not looking at this, and the bloke, the, 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 bloke, the bloke just stood up and looked at me and went, nah, pal, you choose a few windows because you're leaving in bits. <laughs> Like, honestly, that, you felt the tension. It was like that, everyone was on the train just looking at the thing like this. I was the only one that was going around touching windows to see which ones were loose. I was like, I'll oh, before this one here. Probably get through that window. But that meant it. And you never really uh, see many middle-aged people like this argue a lot. That's normally the kids, and it's the young people. They get excited. They've got that sort of energy. Um, they're like the 15-year-old. The lad behind you, how old are you? 54. What is this? This is unbelievable. <laughs> uh, can I just check? Are you all living in freezers for the rest of the year? <laughs> Nobody here looks their age. You, you all look like you're in your 20s. Is it literally, you just, you all go and lay in the freezer for a couple of years ago. Let me help when the festival's on. <laughs> Come on, Dave. 
Well, you've probably seen young people get excited. I was walking through the estate and I saw these two young lads, probably like early 20s. And I walked through, and one of the lads just said to the other, he goes, I told you, don't mess with me. I'm 100% gangster. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, who's bringing the CV and qualifications to a fight? Right? You know what I mean? <laughs> I've never been through a posh area where I've heard kids going, I told you, don't mess with me, I'm a 100% chartered accountant. Right? Bring it on, right? <laughs> and it's changed, hasn't it? You look at the young kids now, you look at it. I remember 1982, right? I was six years old, right? And I've literally, I know this very well, because me, my mum, my brother and sister, first time we come to a place called Redcliffe, which is uh, in Millsborough, England, we turned up, my mum couldn't speak any English. None of us could speak any English. All we could speak was Farsi. Now, Farsi is the national language of Iran. Iran is near Bradford. And we turned up. <laughs> my mum had turned up. She realised that. She just turned up and we had to get into a school. She just walks into this school. Like, the first school that she walks in was. She goes up to the teacher and she goes, Salam alaikum, holy khubiye, no pacha hasta ma khumbi on your mattress. And the teacher goes, whoa, 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 sorry, sorry. We only speak English. You need to speak English. So my mum turns to us in Iranian and she said, speak to the teacher in English, tell her you want to come here to school. I don't know any English. You never taught us any. Look, just because I walked into a school doesn't mean I suddenly learn English. You speak to her. We started arguing in Iranian. It's good. You don't know The teacher then, she understands what's going on. She goes, right, mum, you, go away. You, go, go, children, come here. She took the kids, she put us in the class at this in school and we had to pick up English words and we sat there. That is, and at lunchtime, the kids are all getting sorts to eat, and they go down, I'm sat there, and the teacher comes over and she goes, what would you like to eat? And I said, oh, thank you very much. Um, just some cheese with bread. That's lovely, thank you. I don't understand what you're saying. And I was looking around, I thought, I can see people eating bread. She goes, just cheese with bread, thank you. She goes, I don't know what you're saying. And what I didn't realise I was actually saying to was, Mamma Home, Pane Bonoon, Khil Mucheta. I was speaking fast to her. She went over and rang me mum. She said, What does your son want to eat? He's got the wings. And my mum said, Khil Mucheta, Pane Bonoon, Khushor Shimana. So I'm sat there and the teacher didn't know what to do. She comes over, she gets a piece of paper, puts it on the table in front of me like this. She gets a pen, passes me the pen, and she slowly says, Draw, draw what you want. So I drew picture of a house swimming pool and Cindy Crawford. <laughs> I said, forget about the cheese and bread, let's focus on these three things here. Right? Then by the afternoon, I was dying for a wee, and I didn't know what to say. Uh, we, so I was, we would say, shosh, I'm um, coming back there, shosh. Teacher didn't know what I was doing. Now I know it's very different. Scotland, I understand, it's very different to England. In Scotland, uh, Scot uh, Scottish people just cheer. Who's the Scottish people there? Yeah. Uh, Scottish people are very different, I know. Uh, here, you, you don't say we, it's uh, posh, posh, is that right? <laughs> posh, posh, posh. There's one woman actually having a posh just then. This is the thing, Scottish is, is brilliant because Scottish, you don't actually use words, you use sounds of what it sounds like. Is it just like, posh. <laughs> For the English people, they don't say it all in Scotland, they go, eh. That's what it just sounds of posh. I didn't know how to say posh, I didn't know how to say we, I didn't know how to say that. I'm going short shots. And the teachers looked at me and thought, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wet myself a bit. So I thought, I've got to run out of the class, I've got to find the toilet. So I run out of the class and I just led down the corridor. Ed Master's room here, different classrooms here, no toilet. I'm panicking, I'm about to burst like this. So I just run out the front of the school, literally the front of the school doors. I can't hold it anymore, I just drop my pants and just lean on the school and just wee on the building. And then I can hear teachers running out, and, the, and one of the teachers, one of the teachers goes, it's the Iranian kid, I don't know where he's gone. And then, the, the, then one of the teachers goes, oh my God, he's over there, he's weeing on the building. <laughs> and then the end master comes out and goes, okay, just relax, he's, he's probably just blessing the building. It'll be all right. It's, I think that's what they do in Iran. Just, and then there was a teacher who knew our family, and she comes out and she goes, hang on, his dad's Irish. And the headmaster went, yeah, it's all right, I've seen a lot of the Irish. Also weird on buildings at the weekend. Just, I'm already there this week. Now, weeing on buildings is an act of social problem all around the world. Everyone does it. In Holland, it's the biggest problem at the moment. A lot of drunks will come out of the pubs and they'll wee on the side of the wall or in the alleyways. In Holland, it's the first country 
with the, with the government and the scientists to develop a thing called anti weed proof paint. What they do is they get this paint and they put it on the walls where people come and weed on it. And it laminates the walls. It's a see through paint, so you can't tell it's been done. And they've filmed videos of it. It's amazing. They'll be selling it all around the world. You can see it on the internet. Drunks will come out, and if you hit this wall where it's waterproof with water, it will come back at the same speed. <laughs> and it's amazing. They film like drunks just coming out unzipping like that. <laughs> the only problem is your brain has got muscle memory, right? It has got muscle memory. It'll happen to you a couple of times, but then you'll soon learn the loopholes in it. You'll soon learn. If you can position yourself, you can actually have a wee and hit your mate at the same time. You're gonna have, watch this, I'm gonna get Steve at the bus stop. <laughs> now, the 1980s, huge decade. 50% of the people in this room here were effectively massive. By, by even, and even the young kids are. All the women in this room, by the start of the 1980s, became more powerful. They, they did a thing called power dressing. Women started to come out of the houses, started to take control of the jobs. And look at this, right? For all the people back there, you would not be able to see the stage if this was 1980, right? <laughs> all these women here, yes, look at the women there. All these women would have <laughs> big shoulder bags, big blue front hair like this. It was ridiculous. In the 1980s, every woman went out the house with shoulder pads. The bigger the shoulder pads, the tougher they looked, they were more powerful. You're too young for this 15 year old, but it died out in the 90s. Look, she's Googling. She's trying to get you an image. She's like, <laughs> in the 90s, it died out. Women still kept the power dressing clothes, but they lost the shoulder pads because in the 90s, women started to get mirrors in the house. They could see how ridiculous they looked. <laughs> Jesus, Sharon, I look like an American football player. Why didn't you tell me? 38-42, take that. And then, and then by the 90s, they kept the claws, but the pads went, they sold the pads to a company called Tenor Lady. And, and it's a type of Pokemon character, don't go it. Um, <coughs> it absorbs power. Now, so this is what happened. It was crazy. Power dressing, right, that was invented in the 80s, even to this day, right, is huge. It empowers women. It is worth 17 billion pounds in Britain. 260 billion pounds around the world is spent by women empowering themselves, buying stuff to make themselves more powerful. So it's not shoulder pads anymore, different stuff. Women now, right, women now not spend millions but billions in Britain, right? They've already got nails, but they're going to buy other nails to put on the nails that you've already got. It's like you've already got shoulders. <laughs> you've already got nails, put other nails on the nails. You don't believe me, right? One out of every three shops that opens in a high street in Britain is a nail bar. They are recession proof. Shops are closed and the only thing that opens is nail bars. One out of every three. The other two shops are charity shops and Greg's. These are the only <laughs> things. Women are going in there, getting nails done, then going to the Greg's and stabbing pasties. That is the only thing. <laughs> And it is a power dressing thing because women will put nails on. Women will not turn up to events, to a, a wedding nightclub with just normal nails. They want to put all these other powerful nails on. And it's not to attract other men, it is to scare off other women. It is a power dressing thing, isn't it? Because no blokes have ever been in a club going, Steve, that is the last for me. Which one are you looking at? I'm looking at the one who's got the 10 mini daggers just swaying around there. <laughs> Struggling to hold a pint, she can protect you with this hand and hold a kebab with this hand. Look at this. Bit of chicken sheesh, lamb, tinker. Huh? And the lashes. The lashes are the other power dress thing. Women have already got lashes, but it's not enough. They can buy other lashes to put on the lashes that you've already got. It's ridiculous. Bigger lashes. It's Saturday night. You look at it. Later on, you look down the high street here on a Saturday night in Edinburgh, you'll see the women can't even lift their heads. They put too many lashes on. You all right, Jackie? Yeah, I just like cleaning the streets as I'm walking. <laughs> and that is power dressing. That is what we do. It is mental. Now, you don't understand. That power dressing actually makes it harder for women now because women have to like, spend £30 on nails to put on the nails, £10 to put on lashes to put on lashes. Now, this is Edinburgh. You people are minted, right? <laughs> There's different parts of, of Britain that can't afford that. Girls, where are you girls from? You look quite posh. Where are you from? Preston Pant. Okay, so I was, okay, I was a bit wrong. Okay, so we've got um, <laughs> I love that. As soon as we have Preston Pant, there's just a bit of tension around the room. <laughs> Jesus. Should be taking other people's fingers and nails. 
But you know what it's like, you've all dressed up very well, you've all... And then, now you understand, press the pants. That is, no, that is a lot of money. You're spending £40 on your nails and lashes before you've left the house. There is girls and women all around right, the UK that can't afford to spend 40 quid nails and lashes before they've left the house. £40 is their money for the night. They're panicking, all the friends, you've all turned up with your lashes, and they've looked out the window, oh my God, my friends are turned up with lashes. They're panicking, they're running around the house looking for Danny Longlegs. <laughs> well, that'll do. I'll just get a patch. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. And, and it is crazy. Power dressing only works for women. It's never taken off for men. There you've got a nice bit of stubble there. You've got a nice little tash there. You've got a bit of stubble. For men, it never works, does it? You've never had a mate come around the house just on the off chance going, come on, Steve, we're going to go out, mate. We'll just go outside. And you've got, oh, you've not given me any notice. I've got a beard, but I need to get another beard to stick on the beard. <laughs> Grandad, have you finished the shower? I need to get some air out of the plugs all. Huh? And my mum, my mum, 1982 onwards, the late 80s, now mid to late 80s, she's now living in England. She was Iranian, she's come over, and she now was doing exactly what all the rest of the British women was. She was exactly like you guys, she was like that. She started power dressing, she's wearing shoulder pads, she loved Diana, Dallas, Dynasty, she's like, she's Dressing up like that, amazing. Ironically, her sisters, her aunties, cousins and nieces, still in Iran, they were power dressing very different. In Iran, power dressing in the 80s was wearing bulletproof, camouflage, <laughs> gas masks. You know? The women in Iran, if they wanted lashes in the 80s, they'd have to get caught having an affair or drinking alcohol. You know? <laughs> and even to this day, it's the same. You get caught. You get caught having sex before marriage in Iran or the Middle East, you get 40 lashes. You get caught drinking alcohol, you get 80 lashes. You get caught on a stag do, you get 120 lashes and you lose your 50 pound deposit. It is very strict out there. And it was mental, because in the 80s, from 1980 to 1988, they were wearing gas masks and all this stuff because Arabs and Iranians were killing each other for eight years during the 80s. Now, for the kids who won't know this, some of the older people might remember this, it's on the news, but what happened is, right, now when people got Arabs and Iranians, same region, it's the same sort of thing, people kill each other. Now the thing is, if you call an Iranian an Arab, it's like going to Glasgow and calling a Glaswegian English, right? <laughs> exactly, wouldn't it? They would be furious. Obviously, once they calm down, they're still selling the drugs. But they would be, honestly, it is that. It is crazy. And this was the thing, and I only found this out because my mum, right, my mum is <coughs> half and half. She's half Arab, half Iranian. And my granddad was telling me this when I was going up, he goes, you need to understand. I am Iranian, but your nana, she is Arab. And we do not get on. <laughs> I said, you don't get on, mate, because you're married. He went, no, no, no. We do not get on because Arabs and the Iranians are very different. Now, the Iranians, uh, we speak in Farsi. Now, a Farsi is a language that he's come from in the middle of Persia, a little bit of Arabic, Urdu and French. The Arabs, Arabs, they speak Arabic, which is made up of shouting, phlegm and scousing. They're like, <laughs> I'm not making this up, but you've seen them all with the curly hair and moustaches. They are proper Arabs. Now, um, the second thing is that he goes, and you need to understand, it is heritage, same as Scotland and English language. He goes, heritage, it is the lineage. You look at the Iranians, we descend from Persia, the oldest dynasty in the Middle East. The Arabs, Arabs, they descend into airport shouting, Ali Akbar! <laughs> Bit tense here. <laughs> Listen, I did that in, in Egypt, they loved it. Now, uh, it was a Russian crowd, but it's still a thing. Now, isn't it? <laughs> so middle class, this festival. Now, the thing is... <laughs> I'm not sure if we can look for it. And, do you feel the tension there? Now, you felt a little bit of tension. You talk about Arabs, you talk about Arabs. You feel a little bit of tension in the room. Let me say this, a few times that by 10, right? And that tension would be, if we all were back in 1980 in Iran, the tension would be 10 times higher. And only because what they'll do is, in Iran, the Westerners here, you'd be worth three million pounds each, Western pounds, you're worth three million. Look at your friends, three million, six. 
No, I mean, look at that. There's 12 million pound there walking around Preston Pants. Look at that, right? Look at your friend. She's like that. Pass me the phone. Let me get Anton Khomeini on, yeah? I'll sell you Lisa and Jackie for six million. Bring the money over and some lashes, yeah? And what it was was, um, uh, Westerners were taking off. Look, it wasn't that Iranians didn't like Westerners. Iranians loved Westerners. The only problem was, um, you know, most of them were marrying Westerners, but the problem was that during the 80s, they were taking Westerners hostage, selling them back to the West for three million so they could buy weapons to fight Saddam. Now, my dad, he's Irish, he's a Westerner. He's there like this, all of them, he's a welder pipe fitter at the steelworks. He's there, all, all, everyone had gone except for my dad. He stayed over and the family going, you've got to go. And they would take the hostage. And my dad's like, nah, it'll be all right. Try and take me. I'll be all right, I'll stay here with the man. They went, you are crazy. They would take hostage and he went, no, no, no. And then he wasn't, there was no point in staying in Iran anyway because the oil fields were bombed. But he found out over the border, 30 miles away, Saddam's oil fields were still working. He could sneak across there. My mum couldn't leave Iran. They closed all the airports. There was a curfew. None of the kids, no one from Iran, none of us could leave like that. We had to stay. But he managed to, with his mates, who's a local lad, said that if you get in across to Iraq, just go and work there for a bit. The only way you could get into Iraq in the 80s from Iran was in a tank or with the army. Or some of the local guys, these Kurds, Afghans, and the Shia fighters from Iran were taking little buses and running them across the border. And they were taking bags of grenades and going over there to fight. So this bloke gets me down on the bus with a duffel coat like this, a bag of tools, puts him on the bus. Everyone else comes on like this, he sneaks on. They're going across the border. It's all going great. Till eventually he's saying he's getting about halfway across and they're all chatting and they're going around there. What are you doing? What are you doing? You are Western. Western, three million pounds. What are you doing here? What are you doing? And they're all shouting, Western, Western, what are you doing? My dad stood up in the middle of us and he went, All right, fellas. All right. It's all right. I'm Irish. Just relax. And they're all going, You're not cheating on me, come on. I'm not cheating. You're Irish. Irish cheating on you. I are I are I are we all started chanting, IRA, at my dad. My dad's like, going, all right, fellas, it's not a band. Hold on, right? <laughs> For the rest of the journey into Iraq, he could hear them all just going, oh my God, this is great. The Irish are helping us fight Saddam. Oh my God, the IRA are here. <laughs> so he's in Iraq, and then my mum eventually, by the end of 80, 81, she eventually goes across to the Emirates. She sneaks out there, takes the kids, managed to come across, meet our dad later on, then we fly into Amsterdam, end of 1981. Amsterdam is the gateway to Europe. Now, it has not changed. It is exactly the same for the kids, 15 year old. It's the only older people here. These people have all been Amsterdam from work experience. Look at these behind you. Look at 54. No wonder he stays so young. Look at him, he's getting herbs there. Look at his allotment that he's brought over from Amsterdam. And, and it was exactly the same. Over there, like, it was in 1981, it was so easy. Get into Amsterdam, and then they were gonna fly in to England. And my dad was going to work, he's working at Steelworks, but the problem is, at the end of 81, my dad, like my mum, has never been to Europe before. She's panicking, she's a little bit nervous there, but my dad is worse than my mum. He's Irish, right? And this is the second attempt he's had at coming to the UK. The first time he came, he was a teenager, and it was horrific. He came with four lads, they had a van and a cat, they used to go around doing odd jobs. He came over, when a teenager, and it was horrific. Back then, they used to have signs up in England everywhere you go for accommodation saying, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Right? Their cat was all right. He used to get a double bed with an on suite and they'd all sleep in the van. Right? And my dad was having doubts about it. He was like, eight months, he, he was worried about coming back to me. The problem was, in 1981, not only were English people not keen on Irish people, English people were terrified of Irish people. Because in 1981, 82, the terrorists weren't like the terrorists today. The terrorists today, they're all like Middle Eastern look here, a little bit orange skin, they've like got Middle Eastern names, speak Arabic. In the 80s, it was totally different. If you had a Gaelic name, Irish accent, you were pale skin. That was what a terrorist looked like. 80s, 2010, this decade, is Arabs. It'll change. 2040, it'll be a totally different country. It'll be Iceland. They'll have exploding mackerels everywhere. <laughs> Bjork will be the call to prayer. And, and it's hard to understand, but this is what it was like. In 80, 82, 83, he would always get stopped and searched by the police. He had a van, he'd be going into the steel work sometimes in the daytime, sometimes at shifts, all the ice cream, because they're working different shifts. The police would always stop him and put sniffer dogs in, looking for Semtex, because it was the way the IRA were moving the bombs out, and they were checking all the ice cream. And my dad wasn't bothered, he was used to it. He didn't mind it. 
he'd always get stopped. But after a couple of years, one time, we were all, the family was there, just trying to get home. The police stopped him. They go, all right, mate, what's this, uh, Eugene Owen Monaghan? So you're from Ireland. He goes, no, 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 fellas. Look, we're from the Middle East. Look at the guys. This, we've all come from the Middle East. Look at this. It sounds Irish to me, mate. No, honestly, fellas. We've come from Iran. Look, from Iran. Do you know Iran? Where is it? Is that North or South? No, no, fellas. Iran. Do I need to spell it for you? I, R, A. Get out of the car, sir. Get out of the car. Everyone out of the car. The cat's all right. Let the cat go. Everyone out. And, and it is so hard to, for the kids here, it's so hard to remember this. Look, the news was dominated in the 80s, as it is today. It's the Middle East all the time. You look at it. 1981, Bobby Sands, it went straight back to Ireland, all the news. 1982, Hyde Park bombings, went back to Ireland, all the news. 1983, Sinn Féin, not only a terror group, but now becoming political, went back to Ireland. 1984, here you had the Brighton bombing, the Conservative conference, went back to Ireland, dominate the whole news story. People were terrified of the Irish in the 80s. But then 1988, we had Lockerbie, Horrific. <laughs> this time, it was the Arabs. People were scared of the Arabs, Middle Eastern people, Iranians, anyone like this, as well as the Irish. By the end of 1988, me, my brother and sister, we sat down, we talked about getting new parents. We said, this is... <laughs> we got to get rid of these two, they're a liability. Constantly on the news, we're trying to blend in here, look at these two. My sister had a match, she said, let's get two from Switzerland. My brother said, look, I've met this guy from Somalia. He's got a board. I think he's all right. <laughs> Everyone loved the Somalians back then. Not a problem. <laughs> and then, and it was crazy, because for my mum and dad, in the 80s, of course, it was took their immigrants. It was, you know, it was hard for them. Listen, for me, my brother and sister, it wasn't so bad. Even though we were immigrants, we could blend in. It was easy. We got a, a, a local accent. T's accent, blending, not a problem. Only in 1989, a couple of times in the States, when it was constantly in the news and it was getting worse, and people were scared in the Middle East. Like I remember coming through uh, one time, there was a guy there from the estate, some nutter, I'm walking through, and he went, I'm sick of you foreign people, you, you dirty foreigner, come here. I'm looking around, I think, where are the foreigners? Who are you talking to? And he goes, I'm talking to you, you dirty Arab, come here, you dirty Arab kid. Like and I'm thinking, what is he talking about? There I was, right? eating pistachio nuts, carrying a bag of saffron rice with a little fez. I was like, how's he know? I only had a fez on because I like Tommy Cooper. And I'm looking at it. Uh, it was the weirdest thing. He comes over like this, and he grabs the back of me with his hand like this, and he goes, do you know, he goes, why does your mum have a red dot on her head? I say, mum doesn't have a red dot on her head. And he got his finger, and he put it in my forehead like this, and he goes, it's because the council keeps saying, no, 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 you can't have another council house. <laughs> like that. I mean, it was all, all grammatically wrong. I mean, we were living in a caravan. So I was looking at him like that. I said, we can't even get on the council list. We're on the layback. So I'm looking at him like this. And then when he'd finished, I just looked back at him. I said, mate, why does your mum have a red dot on her head? And he just looked at me like, what? I said, it's because my uncle Brendan is in the IRA. He's watching your house. <laughs> Unbelievable. I don't make threats, just promises. And, um, carried on eating with pistachio nuts. But the thing is, um, this is the thing is, people always get tent. You mentioned foreigners, people always, it's, it's so funny because most of us have got some sort of foreign ancestry. This is an island. Most of you even got foreign parents or grandparents. Most of us have probably got foreign friends or married to foreigners. Just put the lights on one second, Clint. Let me have a quick look. Don't panic, don't panic. <laughs> Look at your faces, Jesus, it's customs. He's gonna stop us. <laughs> right, let's have a look. Put your hands up if you've got a foreign parent or you are a foreign East or if you just come from somewhere. Let's have a look. So let's have a look. So put your hands up, be proud. Let's have a look, let's have a look. Who's... Look at the holding cell. Look at this, just... We've got one up there, yes. There, well, look at this guy lifting his missus' hands up. Get your hand up. Get your hand up because I'm gonna go around the room and point at people who look foreign. Yes, go on, fella, where are you from? Glasgow, so we've got Glasgow. <laughs> God bless you, he's crossed the border to get in. Glasgow and Dublin. So they've got flat hands like Glasgow, Dublin. Yeah, the other hands, keep your hands up, Cole. Yes, yeah. I'm from Tunisia. From? French Tunisia. 
France, Tunisia, that is a massive house. So it starts in France and goes all the way to Tunisia. I think you've got a tunnel, mate. Okay, that's fantastic. France, Tunisia, beautiful, of course. There you go, France, very, what I love, that's good. Okay, so uh, you speak French and Arabic there, is it? Fantastic, okay, and what about over there, yeah? Irish. Irish, there you go, we've got the Irish, French. The guy here, look at this, yeah. Australia. I could tell, look at you, look, look. Look at that, he's got a suntan. There's no way you're from Scotland, mate. <laughs> Australia, the guy with the sunglasses on his head? Where are you from? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. You've got sunglasses on your head? Okay, good luck. <laughs> Were they left there from three years ago? I just forgot. <laughs> Were you out in Australia a couple of years ago, just forgot to take them off your head while you're just on the flight? And then we had up here, didn't we? Go on, what did we have up there? Ireland. Ireland, so we've got Ireland, Tunisia, French, <laughs> Glasgow, more Ireland. The guy here, where are you? What's your parentage? You there? Me? Yeah, Chinese. Okay, so we've got Chinese. Me, go on. Scottish. Scottish, Scottish, good lad, good lad. And the lady in front of you there, looks very dark. Where are you from? Hamilton. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if she's holding the face, Hamilton. I've been to Hamilton, love, and that's not natural. Okay, that's... <laughs> she was like she's from Bengal. Okay, so you know, that's from Hamilton. Okay, brilliant, okay. Any others? Let's have a look. What about over there? What's happening up there? Nothing over there? Where are you kids from? Cumbria. Cumbria, well there you go. A lot of immigrants there from <laughs> Wales. So, um, now this is the thing. This is the thing, ladies and gentlemen. People always get nervous. I didn't miss any here, did I? No, people, people always get nervous when you talk about foreigners. This is the thing, right? This is the thing. Right? Look, uh, Tunisia, uh, France, you've got two passports, have you? What have you got? Yes, yeah, so you got, uh, what, what are you two? The French and Tunisian. Yeah, there you go, that's us there. Glasgow, what have you got? <laughs> Probably no passport whatsoever. <laughs> but hey pal, I've got my knife, this gets me everywhere. <laughs> Just turn up to customs, I think I'll, you'll let me in, okay. <laughs> and Ireland, you've got Irish passport. This is the thing, Glasgow, so I, I've got two passports. So I've got, um, I've got uh, uh, an Irish passport and an Iranian passport. Obviously, I only use the Irish passport when I'm traveling. The Iranian one, I only use that if I'm going into a cafe and it's rammed and you can't get a seat. I just leave the Iranian one on the table. <laughs> Where did that come from? Okay, I'm gonna leave. Okay, let's go. And I know what it's like, you're probably all sitting there going, okay, Pat, this is a bit tense. Lighten it up, talk about terrorism. Okay, so let me tell you about terrorism. And what's interesting is that we've got people from all over, and, th and this is the thing, people always think with terrorism, right, they think, oh my God, you know, terrorists, unfortunately, they're no longer just born in a region or a place, not just born in the Middle East, they're not just born in, a, in Ireland. Unfortunately, the problem we've got in Britain is that homegrown organic terrorists, 850 uh, ISIS fighters in the last 18 months came from here, from Britain. Now this is ridiculous, you look at it, it's, it's nobody's fault, look, it's not the kids' fault, it, the problem is, so you, young kids now, this is the thing, your age, getting brainwashed easy because you're on the computer and you want to belong to a group. They want to they want to join a gang or something. And kids now either want to join a gang or join a terror group. They're like this, look, 15 year old, just be honest, it's just a yes or no answer, right? Are you in a gang? No. no. So she's a terrorist. <laughs> so this is, this is how, uh, so look, at, look at her panicking in front of oh, Jesus, we've got one in here. Don't worry, we'll try and, listen, we'll try and stop it from being brain brainwashed. We'll just, this is the problem, this is the problem. Look, you wouldn't believe it. Do you know, you know, uh, there's a, uh, one of the fighters out there, this, this lunatic out there, it's called Jihadi Jack. He's a 20 year old lad from Oxford, right? His parents, Oxford, they, there's no heritage to the Middle East. He's from Oxford, he's, all his lineage is from here, from Britain. He had a fantastic, they're a middle class family, all, they had no problems whatsoever. And he's out there in ISIS, and they were interviewing his mother. And the mother, you can see it, it's on the news, she's going, oh, we, we don't understand, we, we think he's being brainwashed, we, we blame hummus. And then the guy was like, um, <laughs> sorry, I think you mean hummus. And she went, no, 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 hummus, he's been eating a lot of Middle Eastern food, we think it's the chickpeas <laughs> have gone to his head, he's been throwing pizza breads at the West. And there's another guy, you've got Jihadi Chat there, you've got uh, another guy, Jihadi Chop. He's again, he's the leader of another one of these split and stuff. There's, there, honestly, there is loads of them out there. There's this ISIS, Islamic State with the Darius, all these other ones. And what they do is, one of the guys out there, Jihadi John, he is, right, from Luton, from Bedfordshire, British born, 25 years old. He's out there now, a leader out there. Do you know what he used to do when he was in Britain? Right? Again, you can Google this. 
He used to be a bouncy castle salesman, right? He used to sell bouncy castles in Britain. That is the only reason how he got the job out there in ISIS, because on his CV, he said, blows up castles. That is the only reason out there, that <laughs> He's there, his training videos. Death to the West. Death to the infidels. Death to anyone who wears shoes on my castle. Ahmed! <laughs> now, obviously, obviously, I mean, it should be easy to catch these terrorists. The reason, because the first name's Jihadi. Anyone with that, just arrest them. <laughs> now, Jihadi Frank, we need to have a chat, mate. Right? Okay. <laughs> and bring Jihadi Dave with you. Let's just have a quick chat. This is it. The 15-year-old, obviously, look, um, you clearly you won't, you, hopefully, 99.9% .9 you won't be a terrorist. I can pretty much say 100% you won't be a terrorist, mainly because, right, also because you're a female as well. If you look at it, very rarely do females get involved with terrorism. Very rarely do you see it on the news because it's men. Young men will kill for sex, whereas women will only kill for love. Only in the last few years, the only time you've ever seen a, a, a last on the news a terrorism, very true, there was a girl in Sweden, right? She was from Sweden. Uh, she fell in love with this lad. She was 19 years old, fell in love with this lad in ISIS. He's fighting over in Iraq. She crossed eight borders illegally to marry him. She had no heritage, nothing in the Middle East. She's from Sweden. She had a great future. She went over there and married this lad in ISIS. Now that is unbelievable. Eight borders. There's not one bloke in here. A married man will cross eight borders to get married. Would you? There's not. You probably cross about three, and then you go. Do you know what? The women here look nice. I think I'll stay. Here. Right? <laughs> and unbelievable. You talk about it's all about immigration. I was like, you look at it. All the immigration movement people. We always panic. Immigration is as scary as it is. The terrorism. Now people think, oh my God, the immigrants come across. Let me tell you this. From all the immigrants in the room, the Irish, Glasgow, <laughs> France, Tunisia, they'll all back me up here. I think it's fair to say you can lock the borders, close the gates. We're here now, so you don't need any more. <laughs> and this is the problem. This is the problem with immigration. Everyone has an opinion on immigration. My uncle's like this. My uncle's like, I believe in the free movement of people around the world. I say, yeah, of course you do. He works as a people smuggler. Right? It's a business. <laughs> uh, now, <clears throat> this is the thing. We are an island. It is common sense. What you've got to do is not everyone can come. So what you do is, of course, we can have immigration, but what we've got to do is you've got to control the borders. It's just common sense. Thing is, we do this policy where we do a one in, one out. If you want to come and work, fantastic. Come and work. That's brilliant. There was a lass that came from Sri Lanka. Uh, she came here to study medicine. She finished in the top 100. And they did a whole article on her. They, were, they said, this is amazing. We've never seen anything like it. What would you like to do? What's your future? And she went, I'd like to stay here and work in the NHS. And they found out then a visa had run out and said, sorry, you can't stay with your here. And I thought, well, this is where you put the policy in. It's a one in, one out. There's loads of these estates in Britain. You've got estates in Scotland, we've got loads in Britain. You walk around in England, just go around the estate, go, yeah, sorry, mate. Uh, sorry to disturb you. What do you do for a living? Is that 100% gangster? Lovely, get your stuff, son. You're leaving. <laughs> what do you do for a living? 100% dealer on that plane as well, son. <laughs> What do you do for a living? 100% estate agent. Get your bags and you're going. <laughs> three doctors in, three dickheads out. Now this is the thing, right? <laughs> Sorry, willy heads, willy heads. Uh, <laughs> this is the thing. Obviously, every country has got to control the body. It's no good just Britain going, we're gonna have a one in one out policy. Every country around the world has got to control the borders. It's not that hard now. Everything's on computers, on, on a system. We can all do it where we go, look, people are always going to move. That's not a problem. As long as we can just move the numbers around. If you want to move, we'll get somebody move there. They can move them there. Just keep moving people around the world. Not a problem. The only thing is, some countries might not uh, comply with that. They might just leave the borders open. They're not bothered. You look at two of the biggest economies, China, you've got India. Huge, over a billion people each. So what you got to do is, any countries that don't control the borders, you penalise them. That's the thing. Look, India might go, do you know what? We're not bothered. We let 40,000 go. We let 40,000 Indians come here without border controls. We go, right, we've got to retaliate. They send us 40,000 Indians. We send them Motherwell. We just send Motherwell <laughs> to India. They'll soon control the borders when there's 40,000 people from Motherwell just walking around India. All right, pal, is there a Scott mid? All right, pal. Huh? <laughs> what the hell is this? It's a cash and carry. Choose a window, pal. You're leaving. Right? They'll be on the borders, but please, no more Motherwell. Please, they don't work. Please, stop the borders. Stop. <laughs> and 
a couple of people giggling, everyone else write that down. Okay, so get Motherwell ready. Okay. I always go back and visit my mum, see my mum that and my mum's like everyone in now. She's like this, she'll watch the news all the time, she watches them, she she just panics all the time. I come home the other day and she and she's like this, she goes, oh, look at them! Look at them when they, they all come here. Look at them what they, they look like terrorists. They know speak English. Look at them when they come here. I said, Mum, you don't know the full story. Hold on a second. No, 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 look at them. Look at them, they all come here. Look at them. Mum, just like, look, that's the mirror. The TV's over there. Just <laughs> <can't wait. Huh? laughs> this is the thing. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, of course, every now and again, uh, we'll get an immigrant that will come to Britain. It'll be amazing. Right, sometimes they can change it for a good reason. We have a lot of negative press in the moment, right? but look at this, right? Way before the kids here were born. In the 60s, there was a kid that came over here with a foreign family, he was an immigrant, he was a Parsi, couldn't speak English. His real name was Farouk Bulsara. No one would know him as that. He got rid of the name, he was embarrassed about the name, he got rid of the name, he got a British name as soon as he could. And in the 80s, he became one of the biggest British pop stars that we had, he played to 1.9 billion people around the world as a British singer. Now, uh, a couple of you might know, I just heard a couple of you whispering, a lot of the young people, you won't know who he was there, but I'll give you a quick clue. So Clint, can you drop that for me? So this is... So this is who he was. 1985, ladies and gentlemen, he was, uh, his real name was Fruitful Star. Richard, ladies and gentlemen. Cliff Richard came from India, ladies and gentlemen, he was born there. Um, you're way too young, 15. He's a famous rapper. <laughs> so, uh, music was huge. In the 80s, ladies and gentlemen, look, in the 1980s, that decade, every country around the world was at conflict with each other, apart from two countries. Everyone was either fighting the neighbours, uh, or internally there were civil wars. One of the big things, let's start in 1980 very quickly, in America. In America, Central, South America, North America, what happened was they were putting, um, how we have estates here, they have projects. They had a lot of immigrants coming in, and what they were doing is they were putting them in the projects, and then what they were doing is the immigrants would kill each other, or even just the locals would kill each other. If you were from that side of the street, different postcode, they would just kill each other, they had different gangs. So I'll show you this very quick, this is what they were doing. Right? And what the, what the council, the local people went round, then to stop the gangs from killing each other, they went in and they said, look, to show if you think you're really tough, right, instead of killing that gang on the other side of the street with guns and knives, why don't you, to show that you're a real man, have a dance off? You dance against them, we'll put music in, we'll provide the music, we'll give you the best food, bang, and you dance off against them and let your steam off like that. It was amazing and it worked. Let me show you this. 1980, do you want to be Bloods or Crips? What do you think? Bloods, okay, good, I'll be Crips. So here we go. So this is what would happen. The, I'll, I'll quickly show you, there'll be a bit of music comes on. I'll just throw something at you for 10 seconds and then freeze and then you'll jump up and just throw anything at me, any dance style. And that is about, everyone here is gonna clap and cheer for you. Please feel free to film it. Okay, so, <laughs> click, drop it, everyone clap and cheer. Okay. Well done. Give him a big round of applause. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.